out of this. Ratings, I'm Shad, and in this episode of Pop Culture Weapons Analyzed, we're going to be looking at the armor of the Mandalorian, as seen in the Disney Plus series, Mandalorian. Specifically, I'm going to be analyzing how protective this armor would be based on its design from a point of reference of my knowledge in historical armor, or even just functional real world armor, because there's some very interesting kind of contrast between the Mandalorian's armor and real world armor. So let's get into it. The first thing that I'm going to comment on is actually the most distinctive and iconic piece of the Mandalorian's armor, and that is the helmet. And the helmet, in my opinion, is brilliant. Okay, this is an awesome design, not just for its kind of iconic, distinctive look, but also its functionality, okay? Now, in terms of the amount of vision you would have from, you know, the eye slots, I need to add a caveat here because it does seem like with it being in a futuristic, I know it's a galaxy far, far away, but it's futuristic technology compared to our own technology, okay? Because it technically happened a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, which would be in our past, but anyway, Futuristic technology based on, from point of reference, all right, okay. But with that in mind, it does seem like these, uh, you know, helmets that Mandalorian wears, we can assume that the Stormtroopers have, and we actually see in regards to Darth Vader's helmet, there's kind of electronic screens built inside, which would give a more enhanced field of view than what the kind of eye slots on the helmet would generally provide. But even having said that, if you are restricted to the field of view that you would only get out of the vision slots that the Mandalorian helmet provides, it would still be enough, okay? If we were to look at historical helmets, those eye slots can actually be far more restrictive than what we even see on the Mandalorian's helmet. The reason being is that the eye slots were a very vulnerable opening in armor, and this is going to be a general trend that you will find throughout historical armor, is that they tried to cover all the openings, and when, like with the eye slots, there wasn't any option but to have an opening, they made it not only small, but in some cases, on the helmets, they had the kind of eye slots, you know, extended a little bit, and then there would be kind of a lip or slide. So if you miss the eye slot, if you're trying to say thrust it into it with a sword, even by the a fraction, okay, you would hit this lip and it would slide away from the eye slot and not into the eye slot. And so they were very, very uh, conscious of protecting all these opening parts in historical armor and making those eye slots as small as possible. Now this, of course, restricted vision considerably, yet medieval knights were still able to fight to a very high level of functionality. So they were still able to do it, but it's difficult. Even reenactors who wear historically authentic armor, well, they've been able to comment on how restrictive this vision is. And it's very common, the reason why, in fact, uh, many helmets had a visor was so the knight could actually lift the front plate of the helmet and get a better, you know, look around, see his periphery, see if there's any enemies, and ah, if there's someone there, bang, help, the visor goes back down, and now they've locked on, they can keep these small little openings towards their opponent, and while they have, you know, their opponent in sight through these small openings, they're generally quite functional still. What's interesting, of course, is that the Mandalorian helmet doesn't have a visor, but again, this is sci-fi technology, that wouldn't really need it. We can assume that his field of vision is actually full with uh, whatever advanced technology is on the inside. But even if, say, the power cuts out on the helmet and the Mandalorian is then just restricted through those eye slots, perfectly enough vision to do what he needs to do. There would be limitations, of course, with the power cut out, but still enough to, you know, he might accept the visor part, that's a problem, but still, if he can find the target, he just needs to keep the target within his field of view, and he would be able to fight quite effectively. The other thing I want to compliment on the helmet is that it is a fully protective helmet, all the way around, fully in case, okay? So that's really good, but unfortunately, it's one of the only instances where a piece of the armor covers that body part completely, because when we come to the other parts in the armor, this is where the design unfortunately starts to fall apart. It is not full body armor, and if you look at historical examples of armor, that generally is the trend, okay? Whatever type, if, it, if it's linen armor, and yes, linen cloth armor did exist, there was many, many layers called gambeson, and in fact there was actually a lot of names like padded jack, Akaton, and other things, and it wasn't just many layers, sometimes wool was 
sandwiched in between. Sometimes it was made out of linen or even silk in the higher up, more expensive times. But it was actually very effective, okay? But the point I'm trying to make here, even if it was linen or mail, chainmail, people generally know what chainmail is, and full plate, it covered most of the body, or at the very least, all the torso. So with a gambeson, full body torso and down covering the upper thighs, armpits and shoulders. Now, when you get to, say, male hauberks, there were shorter sleeved hauberks, but the primary thing about a male hauberk, again, covers the whole body. Now, when we come to plate, this is kind of an interesting thing, and this might be where the Mandalorian design could be taking some inspiration, but then misinterpreting a very important thing about partial plate armor. Because the thing about when we, you do come to plate, there are examples of historical plate armor that only covered parts of the body. Like, for instance, pauldrons are a good example. These are the shoulder guards that don't cover the full side shoulder of the body where there's a distinct gap between the pauldron and, say, the breastplate. And there are examples of plate armor that doesn't wrap around the whole body. But the key, very important point about this is that the gaps in between the plate still had armor, generally male and, if not male, Gambeson as well, and it was effective armor that had a good chance of deflecting or preventing blows from penetrating. The unfortunate thing with the Mandalorian's armor is that, from what we see, it doesn't have armor in between. Now when I say armor, look, it looks like there's padding of some type, but this does not seem to be the type of armor that can prevent blaster bolts in the Star Wars universe at all. And it's quite interesting to try and understand how effective blaster bolts are within the Star Wars universe. We know Stormtrooper armor is basically spit against blaster bolts, but there are materials that can not only prevent blaster bolts, that can semi-deflect even lightsabers to a certain extent. Now there's a big kind of in interesting and important material within the Mandalorian, I guess, TV show, but also just Star Wars generally, that the true Mandalorian armor is supposed to be made out of, and it's Baskar, okay? And that stuff is uh, presented quite clearly to be able to deflect blaster bolts, but the Mandalorian, this is where I get into some very minor spoilers. Uh, they're not big, so it's not going to ruin it, but you could kind of expect, now this is a spoiler, but it's not big, so I think even if you stick around, you'll be all right, you can expect that the Mandalorian, his armor is going to up upgrade it as the series progresses. It's kind of a given. It's not a big spoiler. So he does upgrade his armor and he starts off with lower grade armor, which it's not stated explicitly what it's made out of, but it does seem implied quite strongly that it's not Baskar because he gets Baskar material, which he is then able to make more better armor out of. So then what is his original armor made out of? Having said that, the, the helmet does seem to be made out of Baskar from the very beginning. Now, there are other decent strong materials in the Star Wars universe that is resistant to blaster fire but not wholly proof like i was going to say bulletproof but blaster proof maybe and it's called durasteel durasteel is a type of metal that is used in plating on starships architecture and of course armor uh the stormtrooper armor it's not made out of but i i'm assuming the uh, other pieces of the mandalorian armor not counting his helmet at the very beginning is made out of durasteel because it does deflect blaster fire at, in the very beginning but some pieces also get trashed in later fights it's not invulnerable and neither is buskar it's just a lot stronger. Well, going back to the point I was originally making, is uh, pieces of armor, whether they're Durasteel or Baskar, have some very big gaps in between those pieces and the material that's being worn underneath, even if it is a type of armor, that does not seem to be effective at stopping blaster fire, and it shouldn't be. And the uh, kind of plot hole thing element that exists in the show so far is that every time the Mandalorian has gotten hit with blaster fire and he does get hit, I guess he's actually getting hit. If generally because of, you know, plot armor, if a primary protagonist character is getting fired upon, well, they just always miss, you know, the classic, uh, trope that stormtroopers can't aim, though in actual fact that seems to be consistent even when stormtroopers are firing at the Mandalorian, even was wearing armor and it's safe for him to get hit in the plot. And so the riders actually allow him to get shot in some instances because the armor protects it, but when it comes to the actual stormtroopers, they generally still miss. So stormtroopers just still suck overall. <laughs> at least it's consistent. I just, I mean, there's like even one point where a stormtrooper is always point blank with the Mandalorian, like it's only two, three meters away and he still misses. <laughs> Why is the Empire, well, they're not, it's not really the Empire now, it's just, you know, some fragments of the Empire, but why did the Empire even start using stormtroopers? They're horrible. 
And I'm sorry, Obi-Wan, they're not precise, not in actual... Anyway, I know this is all just plot, you know, device, plot armor stuff and everything. They're supposed to be precise, as Obi-Wan says, in A New Hope, but uh, they're not portrayed as being precise as well. Anyway, anyway, I'm getting off on a tangent, but still, my point is, is that whenever the Mandalorian does get hit, because now the writers can allow him to actually get hit, and he doesn't necessarily have the force to dodge and everything, so that makes more sense. It always is hitting the armor and not the very large gaps in between. When he does go to upgrade his armor a bit later on, his front chest piece covers more of his upper body, or like a middle body. It had always covered the upper body, but now it went down a little lower, yet it is still only a front chest piece. The sides, gut, and it looks like the back, I didn't get a good look at his back, he might have a, you know, armor piece on his back. He's going to be wanting to get a rocket pack anyway, they're kind of very iconic with the Mandalorian arsenal and stuff, and that'll be some type of back protection eventually. But overall, we've got a helmet, pauldrons that are not fully encased, okay? Now look, there were historical pauldrons that didn't cover all the way, but as armor developed on, you'll see pauldrons grow with these kind of side wings that moved all the way over to sit in front, or well, partially in front of the breastplate. And this is to cover the gap between the pauldron and the breastplate itself, but generally when these smaller pauldrons are worn, there was male or gamus underneath, which was still effective armor against the weapons of the day in the medieval period, but that's not the case with the Mandalorian. There's a big gap, and so I would have said they should have had much better, you know, uh, pauldrons that uh, kind of had those wing sections that uh, sit over the gap in between the, the cuirass, the breastplate, and the pauldrons. And then he has kind of front thigh guards, and maybe shin guards, and of course, braces. That's it. There's still a lot of open areas. Now, I, like I was kind of saying before, there were many instances with historical armor that didn't encase the whole body in armor, but they did cover the primary area, which was the vital organs, the torso. And so with a male hauberk, gams and stuff like that, you're gonna see shoulders, upper arms, chest, uh, you know, the waist and upper thighs, basically fully covered. These are the big vulnerable areas. And they weren't just front chest plates. When there were partial plate armor, it was actually interlinked with male. We actually see kind of the crossover period between male going to uh, plate armor, where plates were actually kind of connected in with the male on the front of the armor. There were many instances where a solid metal breastplate was worn over on top of male, doubling the protection. So that's unfortunate. And at the very least, you would expect like a warrior, like a mandalorian, to at least have a full cuirass breastplate that covered his whole torso, his whole, you know, upper body, waist, uh, all of that, okay? But these are vital organs. And then the pauldrons, or the gap, okay, a bit bigger, but still greaves, van braces, or gauntlet type sci-fi armor. That's just added protection, and uh, it's common that uh, hits can land on the open parts on the arms and legs, but not vital organs there, okay? It's much more survival. You want to cover the vital organs, so full breastplate would have made so much more sense than this weird, you know, half chest piece he has. Just aim for his gut. And I mean, it's general firearm practice to aim for center of mass on a target because that's the easiest part to hit. If you aim for one of the limbs, there's a much higher chance of just missing overall. And so if anyone who is using blasters in Star Wars has that same kind of training and they aim for center of mass, and he, if the Mandalorian had a full breastplate to cover him, that would actually protect him from at most, you know, gunfire, blaster fire that he would be facing. And then of course the helmet, that, like, that's the other main part you'd want to protect, because in, again, historical armor, the helmet was always first, okay? If you, you, I might have been overemphasizing the fact that it was always covered on the chest. When they did wear chest armor, it covered the whole thing, but the first point of protection that you always had first was a helmet. That was the main thing. Shield was also very common if they weren't wearing armor or, uh, other than the shield, other than the helmet. It was like helmet, shield, then, then chest armor. Even the shield actually came before chest armor generally because it's cheaper and very effective. And I really think a lot more people should be using shields in the Star Wars universe. I mean, portable shielding, we don't know if that's really possible or not. We kind of see it on the, uh, the droidy car in uh, the, the episode one. But then we see the Gungans actually having handheld shields. And even if not, there is material that can protect against blaster fire in the Star Wars universe if it's just Durasteel or Baskar. So a handheld shield, really useful.
no one's using it. So that's kind of my main criticism and analysis of the Mandalorian's armor. Unfortunately, it's not perfect, but there are some really cool elements to it. Like I said, I love the helmet. And I just want to kind of finish off some of the rambling bits I was saying about the blaster fire, because there is an interesting kind of uh, point of reference we get to the possible strength of Durasteel, because we see, uh, I get minor spoilers, this is only first episode stuff as well, but if you don't want to hear the spoilers, there's your warning. The bounty droid that the Mandalorian runs into does actually get hit a couple of times with blaster fire and is mostly okay. And the first hit basically does nothing. And so that indicates at the very least is made out of something quite durable and strong. We're not told what it is, but it's a safe bet that you know, the armor on this uh, bounty droid is Durasteel. And so uh, that's what we can assume the uh, early pieces of the Mandalorian armor is also made out of. And that was also quite protective against blaster bolts as well. The very first hit he takes is in the shoulder, which is one of the, you know, less lower quality um, arm pieces. And again, I don't think it's Baskar, I think it's Durasteel. But that droid is killed. And now I'm getting to more spoilers, but look, I've already warned you, so if you're still here, I assume you don't mind about spoilers at all and you've watched it already, because the droid does get killed, but it's a point blank shot. Every other shot that this droid has been hit by was at a much longer range. Now, I do not think the Mandalorian sidearm blaster, not a big, you know, rifle, but his sidearm is any stronger or at least significantly stronger than many of the other blasters that we see. And because we've already been shown that this droid was resistant to blaster fire, it should also be resistant to the Mandalorian's one, but they change. The difference in this situation is that it's point blank. And at point blank, it blasted through his head completely with a single shot. And so that kind of indicates that blaster fire is uh, at its max strength at point blank, close range, and the further you get away, the more energy is dissipated from the blaster bolt, and they're not as strong. I think that's a very intuitive and workable rule within the Star Wars universe if they stayed true to it, because it would be really cool to see them employ much more. It's like, you know, they're in a firefight, and it's like, dang, I can't get through the armor, I need to get closer, and so they have to like kind of creep closer, because again, it's now a rule, I feel it should be a rule, that they should then be true to, and if they crawl and get close to point blank and blast through, the armor that way. That, that's cool because it adds a, a conflict, an additional conflict that can be employed in combat, and it's when we see heroes struggle against limitations and conflicts and then overcome through obeying rules that are established, whether explicitly or implied, it just makes for better storytelling overall. So there we go, that's my review of the Mandalorian's armor. And to sum up, I think he should at least be having a full breastplate. Everything else could kind of remain the same, even the pauldrons, but I would like the pauldrons, you know, cover more of the shoulder. But at the very least, a full breastplate. That, that, that's the baffling thing. And uh, I would have liked going further. My full thing would be full, you know, full armor, like covering everything because that's just plain logic, okay? If you don't want to die in battle, you cover every part that's vulnerable as we see historically. But still, as I mentioned, historically, they at least covered the torso and then they were sometimes okay with having vulnerable parts on their arms and legs because the, the vital organs were covered in the first place. So, look. I'm enjoying The Mandalorian, okay? I think it's a great series. I do recommend it if you haven't seen it already. And if you haven't seen it already, sorry for the spoilers, but you're here anyway, so that means I assume you're okay with hearing it. Thank you for watching. I hope, do hope you have enjoyed. And of course, I hope to see you again. So until that time, bonus rambly musing about Star Wars Blaster Fire. What if there was actually an in-world technology or, or protective something that explained why so many people are just missing. And we don't see full shields that where it hits an invisible barrier and the blaster is defected, deflected, except with the droidy car in episode one. And so personal carrying shielding doesn't exist. And one of the in-world explanations that never been stated actually in canon, or well, the movies, I should say, when I say canon, that can be hard to try and determine what is official canon these days. But anyway, is that the radiation is too high for a living organism to carry these shields that can protect. And maybe they're too heavy and large, but for a droid that's housed on, you know, mechanical legs, that, that's why they can get away with it and regular people can't because personal shielding would be great. But what if, what if there was some type of, uh, I don't know, electromagnetic field that had some level of interaction with the blaster bolts themselves? And the blaster bolts are either turbo lasers or some type of plasma or something like that. But what if there was some type of, you know, electromagnetic field that people could have in a small thing that uh, pushed away, had a level of deflection with the blaster fire, kind of like throwing ping pong balls into a fan and the fan kind of 
deflects it, and the only way you can land a hit is if the blaster bolt itself is dead center to whatever, you know, shielding is generating the deflective force. And so even if you were, say, gonna be hitting here on the shoulder, that would just kind of kind of curve away, and the curve could happen at a decent enough distance so it looks like it's just missing. And so it's like it would curve away if the bolt is like curving, 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 and only if it's dead center would it then land a hit. Or even if it's like a fraction of a millimeter off dead center, those are the hits that actually, they start to get pushed away, but then they land in the shoulder. That would kind of explain all the blaster bolts missing and only hitting kind of, you know, side parts of the body when they do hit. And it's so rare to get a point blank shot. But they never, nothing like that is ever mentioned in the Star Wars universe. I mean, it'd be really useful because that would be a plot point thing. It was like, do you have your deflector that kind of thing on your, on your belt or whatever? Maybe they're so common that me and everyone just has them and they're never mentioned. I, I don't know, I don't know. Or with the Mandalorian, what if? What if the, the segmented armor pieces actually attract blaster fire, okay? So if, they, if a bolt was actually going for like, you know, an, a vulnerable part in between the, uh, the armor pieces, it, it attracts that bolt to hit one of the armor pieces instead of hitting a body, all right? That might be a more workable kind of solution to explain why all the times the Mandalorian is getting hit with blaster fire, it's only on these armor pieces, because that's, that's way too convenient, too circumstantial, okay? Uh, and if you're any brains and you're shooting at the Mandalorian, you're gonna aim for the open parts you would assume. So maybe there's a Mandalorian tech that could still be revealed to explain that it's attracting blaster bolt fire away from the open areas. That could work. It doesn't explain why, you know, apart from the stormtroopers just sucking and not being able to hit the broad side of a barn, why everyone is just missing generally when they're uh, firing on a main character. Anyway, random using just yeah, Star Wars. Well, unfortunately, there's plot holes, but what's disappointing is plot holes can be answered and sometimes in a really cool, satisfactorily way if you introduce a cool kind of technology and then remain true to it because now you have an element that's uh, had more conflict in the combat and all that stuff. It's like, just additional, just think it through. Think it through and it's cool. I have videos on lightsabers as well. Problems with lightsaber combat, I kind of address some of the plot holes that exist with their um, uh, concept of lightsabers. And so it's kind of this rambling musing, you know, like, what if lightsabers should have this, or why didn't they do that? And I was like, anyway, it's good stuff. You'll probably enjoy it. Check it out if you want to.